Hey everyone, we're so excited to gather for worship today. Our church is all about joining God's mission, transforming all things. And we believe that starts in our gatherings. God is here and just might speak to us and transform us. So during today's service, we'll sing to God and hear a teaching from the Bible. Then we'll speak. We don't know exactly what's going on, but we don't need all that tech to worship and to experience God's presence and to be together as the family of God this morning, right? So we want to invite you in, sing along as much as you know. We'll do our best to cue the lyrics to you so that you can sing even if you're not 100% sure, and we'll just do our best and we'll invite the Holy Spirit. So would you pray with me real quick and then I'll share a scripture. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to have your way to draw near to us right now. God, we love you, and we are gathered here in this place for you. And so we say, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in this place. Lord, in spite of, of technology, in spite of it all, Lord, we, we want you. We want to know you. We want to see you. We want to experience you, God. And so come and have your way. This is a reading from Psalm 67, verses 1 through 7. May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. And may the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvests, and God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us, and people all over the world will fear him. So you are here moving in our midst. You are here, you're moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here working. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing that again. You are here. You are here moving, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here, you're working, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you, Waymaker. You are Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, you are Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, God, that's who you are. We long for who you are. You are here. You are here. Touching every heart. Touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. 
turning lives around. You are here. You're turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. See, you are here.
sing, the Lord has promised.
to the cross on our behalf, that you were buried, but that you came back to life, that you are risen. We worship a risen King this morning, and we invite you to inhabit our praise, to inhabit this place, and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. If you're in middle school, uh, as always, you can be released at this time. Your leaders are in the back. They'll take you just across the hall for the rest of your service this morning, but we sure love that you join us for worship uh, as well. If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at the Vineyard, and I just want to welcome all of our guests. You know, every week we have guests and newcomers. We have folks tuning in on the live stream who have maybe never been with us before. We're so thankful that you're here. We also have many others who have been with us for years tuning in on the live stream, and we would love to hear from you. Drop us an email, maybe say hello in the chat, and and make sure that you stay connected as well. Before I begin, I want to just congratulate all of the seniors in the room. Can we congratulate the seniors on their graduation? This is a big life moment. We know, um, we know this is a big life moment for you, and so we are celebrating with you. We're celebrating with the teachers and the parents as well, um, but man, we are celebrating with our seniors. May God bless you in the next step of your journey. This also means that summer is practically right around the corner. My wife and I had a little bit of a freak out moment last week when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do all summer long with our three little ones, but it's a busy time of year, and it's going to be busy around here at the church as well, and so I want to encourage you uh, right now, if, if you want, if you haven't noticed, our slides aren't working, and so what's great is we have, a, we have a fantastic backup plan for you. If you pull out your smartphone and you type in votrweekly.org, votrweekly.org, you go there, you'll see the order of the service You'll see my sermon notes, all the scriptures that I'm going to preach from, but you'll also see all the small groups and announcements that are happening in our church for the whole summer, and we have all kinds of things happening. We have women's events you can sign up for, a newcomer's dinner that Natalie and I will host at our house, a summer sports camp for kids, and all kinds of small groups. We know the summer is busy, uh, but you can stay up to date and follow along at VOTR Weekly. Dot org, uh, even with the rest of the sermon this morning. Okay, well, today I'm wrapping up the final leg in our current series. We've been in this series all May. We're wrapping it up today. The series has been called Money Over Value. Money Over Value. I'm sure many of you are quite relieved 
that this is the last Sunday uh, where I'm going to be talking about all that Jesus had to say about money and finances and generosity. Some of you have been waiting to like invite your friends to church until this series is over. It's over this Sunday. It is over. You can invite your friends uh, and you won't have to feel so stressed about it. No, but I, I've heard from others that this has been a refreshing a transparent, even a challenging way to talk about money, and I'm so thankful that's been your experience because it's definitely been our prayer that you would experience God through the scriptures in that way. You know, I recently got an email from someone in the church about this series, and it was an 81-page research paper written by UC Berkeley titled The Science of Generosity, and it was fascinating. Like, I loved it. If you like to nerd out on that kind of stuff, send me an email. I'll send you the 81-page research paper because it was filled with all kinds of different fascinating studies on how living generously changes your life. And that was essentially the summary of the 81-page research paper, that living generously actually changes your heart. I, I love when science and faith work together or science like magically discovers something that God had preordained long ago. 81 pages about the physical benefits, physical benefits on to, to your body when you live a generous life. 81 pages on how morality and generosity tend to grow together, how giving increases your happiness, makes you easier to work with. And one of my favorites was that when you live generously and give abundantly, your brain releases all kinds of hormones and dopamine receptors in your brain go crazy. Like all of the same hormones that are released during enjoyable and pleasurable activities. If you can let the hearer understand, the same dopamine hormones are released when you live generously as other enjoyable activities. We'll talk about just one of those activities today. I can promise you that. But anyway, here we are, that wrapping up this series with our final message. Some of you didn't get that. You're going to have to actually watch the replay because it just went over your head, but it's okay. We're going to move on. Final series, final sermon in this series, this title or this message is titled, Money Over Love. Money Over Love. In our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives, we will be tempted from time to time to choose money over love. I'm going to open with a passage that I taught a few weeks back. This is uh, Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Notice there are no qualifiers in that passage. There are no workarounds. There are no exceptions to the rule. Jesus simply states, you cannot love or you cannot be devoted to both God and money. Now, it's, it's very rare that I meet someone who openly admits that they love money more than God. Church folks, tend to hide those kinds of confessions from pastors. But what's more common is that as we share life and as we open up to one another, and I learn a little bit more about patterns and behaviors and lifestyles, I begin to pick up on maybe small inklings or leanings of how our heart does. It is like a pendulum. And every now and then we sway towards money, sometimes even to the detriment of our loving relationship to God. This rarely happens overnight. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning saying to themselves, you know what, I, I am finally going to ditch God. I'm just going all in on money. Like that's, that's going to be my MO from here on out, right? But in the most extreme cases, money can become our God. 
Money can become our God. And if not our God, it could become our Lord. It can become our master. And all of a sudden, it's more demanding and it's starting to make our decisions for us. And we're responding to the way that money wants to enslave our lifestyle. And all that we're left with is the anxiety and the stress in its wake. That's why occasionally hearing messages on money and generosity is so important. Digging into the scriptures on what Jesus said on these topics are important so that we can invite God's word and his presence to sharpen our hearts, to remind us what true life in the kingdom looks like. So one more time, once again, the words of Christ, you cannot love both God and money. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. I mean, this verse, Matthew 6, 24, this is the crux of this entire series we've been in. Who will you love? Who will you serve? And who or what are you going to be devoted to? You know, the juxtaposition of loving God or money, it, it really impacts our entire life. It impacts all kinds of relationships. And so as we work our way through this message this morning, we're going to look at a a couple of different relationships or a couple of different loves that, if we're not careful, can be impacted by our love for money. First, we're going to look at how some choose money over love for ourselves. Instead of loving ourselves and caring for ourselves and and maintaining healthy balance in our own mind, heart, soul, body, that we choose money over ourselves. You might be tempted or or struggle. Some of us have gone quite far down the road of loving money over ourselves, and it has cost us. It's cost us. It's cost you stress. It's cost you anxiety or mental health, or in the most extreme cases, this is where we see like a midlife crisis, which can cost you both literally and figuratively. And we know that we should never choose money over our own health. We, we know the right answers in our head, but money is a tricky thing. It can sneak around the edges of your heart. It can begin to woo you one way or the next. And over time, it will slowly demand more and more and more of your heart. And then one year from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, you look back and you say, how have I gotten here? What has happened that I would land in this place? Why do I always think about money? Why do I lie awake at night trying to balance my checkbook when I know nothing's changed? Why have I pulled out my phone and looked at my bank app five times today, hoping that somehow the balance would increase or the bills would decrease when I've done nothing to make a difference? How have I gotten here? Like I said, this usually doesn't happen overnight, which also means that if you want to change, it's probably not going to happen overnight as well. But the secret, at least the secret for many of us, It's not found in checking your bank account on your phone less. It's actually by increasing contentment with where you are today. It's by increasing contentment with where you are today. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says it this way, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In Hebrews 13, 5, you see these two ideas working almost against each other, love for money and contentment. They're coming up against each other, and you read, actually, that contentment is a great antidote to the love of money. And in a lot of ways, your varying levels of contentment in terms of where you're at financially will begin to describe how much you love money. It's not always a perfect linear relationship, but if you lack contentment around finances, it should be a spotlight to a love for money that might be bubbling or even overflowing in your heart. It could manifest itself by finding, when you find yourself craving more money and more possessions and wanting to accumulate and consume more and more and more. But the opposite could be true. It's still a sign of discontentment if you live in fear that there's never going to be enough or that God won't provide for you or care for you. Both of these things are actually pointing out an area that needs to be healed within your heart. According to scriptures in Hebrews 13, 5, contentment is a key ingredient in your ability to have money without loving money. 
God may give you more, and you can be content. God may give you less, and you can be content. Because contentment will help you live this stress-free life when it comes to finances. If you can't find that level of contentment in your lifestyle, you'll end up doing crazy things, right? I mean, I, I can speak with incredible credibility behind this because I have done crazy things when I've struggled with contentment. I have gotten caught up in the demands of money. I've let it sway me off of a centeredness on Christ. When I worked in sales, it was 100% commissions, and so you got paid for what you provided and what you produced. And in that season of my life, man, there was always one more sale I could make. There was always one more network I could explore. There was always one more competition that I could win in sales. And what it did was it created this striving sense within me where it was always go, 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 earn more deals, make more sales. I'd leave before the kids were awake and I'd come home after they were asleep. I remember being vigilant about taking a Sabbath day or taking a day off, but I was worthless to my family because I was so exhausted from the previous work week. I wasn't the kind of husband that I wanted to be. I wasn't the kind of dad that I wanted to be. I wasn't the kind of man that I wanted to be. I thought about quitting and just moving on, but I realized that with my personality and I realized that with my wiring, that actually quitting and going to another job wasn't going to solve anything. I was just going to take that same striving to the next job. What I needed to do was I needed to learn how to be discipled in the midst of that position. And so I had to do the hard work of setting limits in the midst of my job instead of just running to a new one. And I realized like in this room and online, all of our personalities are not the same. This sounds like a foreign language to some of you, but this is part of who I am as part of the brokenness in me coming out. I had to do the hard work of setting limits, of learning to build contentment. And I had to do the hard work of trusting God and trusting that when he said in Hebrews 13, 5, that he would never leave me nor forsake me, that it also meant he wouldn't leave my, or, or leave my bank account or forsake my bank account, that he would provide for me and make sure that I had enough for my family as well. And so I ended up taking less sales calls. And I ended up meeting with my manager and with his permission, I even took a few afternoons off. And it was hard to do. I mean, it was really hard to do, partly because of my wiring, partly because of my brokenness, but also, remember, it's 100% commission. So if you didn't work, every time I didn't take an appointment, it felt like opportunity lost. But all of a sudden, I realized, man, I'm not as burned out as I once was. I started that job, and I was like solely focused on my sales and on my numbers, but I finished it with a focus on my discipleship in the midst of my job. And it changed my life. Limits helped me discover contentment, which has changed my life. If you're looking for something radical to consider this morning, then there are some who I'm connected with that I know they have set limits on their income. And it's countercultural, and I realize that it's probably not going to be for everyone, and that's okay, but there are people that I know who plan their budget, and once they reach a predetermined income, they give the rest of it away. They make a budget, and once they hit that predetermined number, it's not a moving target based on how you feel month to month, they said at the beginning of the year, and once they hit that target, they give the rest away. Their budget includes giving, it includes savings and investments, it includes fun, even vacation, But once they hit that mark, they give the rest away. There are others that I'm connected with who try a more hybrid approach. They they give 10% of their income up to a certain point, and then anything they make above and beyond that, they just give more than 10% on that remaining amount. They give 20 or 30 or sometimes even 40% on everything they make after a certain point. Points. It's almost like a progressive giving approach. And I've loved that idea because these self imposed limits will build contentment within your lifestyle. They'll build contentment while still encouraging radical generosity, while still encouraging radical 
generosity. See, contentment is so vital to our lifestyle. It's so vital to walking with God and loving Him and loving ourselves because otherwise we'll just consistently live in that anxious space of finances and money. So that's the first point, that money can impact you, that you can begin to choose money over loving yourself. But if you pull that thread a little bit more, you also see that money and your love for money can sometimes impact your love for others. That if you begin to lean towards money too often or too much, that it can impact how well you can love the people around you. The story of my sales job, if you think about that, of course, it, 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 excuse me, it impacted me. It affected me, but you know it affected my family too. It impacted my family. I paid the price in stress and anxiety. I paid the price in long hours and constantly working, but my family paid the price because I was a tired dad. I was a tired dad who worked too much. And this can happen for all of us. If we're not careful, we can choose money or earning more and gathering more and striving for more to maybe maintain our lifestyle or increase our lifestyle at the cost of those closest to us. Natalie and I will occasionally do premarital counseling for couples who are dating and they want to get married. And when we do premarital counseling, we always talk about, well, we talk about everything. We talk about all the good topics Right? We always, but specifically, we tell them on the front end, hey, if you're going to do this with us, I just want you to know on the front end, we're going to talk about the big three, communication, sex, and money. We're going to talk about those three things because the enemy wants to attack those things, and he will to attack those things to try to destroy your marriage. And so we're going to talk about, I just want you to know on the front end, you can choose if you come to the next appointment or not, but we're eventually going to talk about these three things. We get to know each other pretty well in those, in those meetings. But this is the reality. If if we don't talk about money, if we don't figure out money in relationships, sometimes we can begin to choose money to the detriment of those that God has placed in our lives. I was thinking about how many grandparents have kind of put their arms on my shoulders and looked me in the eye and say, Jeff, it goes way too fast. Enjoy these moments. Right? I've heard that so many times. Parents, How many times do we need to hear that before we take it seriously? How many times do we need to hear that before maybe we take an afternoon off or we create a fun activity or we spend time intentionally with our children because we don't want to repeat that same story, oh, I wish I would have taken more time off because it goes way too fast. And I'm not saying ignore your responsibilities. I'm not saying ignore your job. We all have things to do. We all have responsibilities to keep. And actually being a hard worker gives God glory too. And it's a testimony that you also want in your family. But if we're not careful, the pursuit of money will cost us the relationships that are closest to us. Of course, the pursuit of having more impacts our family relationships, but it also impacts us from giving to those in need around us. If we have a constant craving for more and more and more and padding our bank accounts, it's harder to give it away when people are around us in serious need. And the Bible has some strong words about that kind of reality when it comes to money. 1 John 3.17 says this really strong verse. 1 John 3.17, if someone has enough money to live well, and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? It's like this rhetorical question that John is writing out to the church. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need and shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? That's a strong word. That is a strong word, and it draws a line in the sand that says, your ability to demonstrate compassion to those in need is directly tied to God's love working in and through you. Now, we could argue that compassion doesn't always include money, and I'd be willing to admit that of course not, right? Of course, compassion includes other things besides money, but according to this scripture, in the context of this scripture, the author is talking about people who have financial wealth. The author is talking about people who have enough to live and see someone in need. 
So clearly, the author is also saying that it, that it takes action, that true compassion requires sacrifice from those who have. It requires a matching of faith and deeds together. Here's the beauty of compassionate and joyful giving, is that when you give with joy, when you give with compassion, it directly counteracts your love for money. Every time you give an offering, every time you tithe, every time you give a special gift, you are training and discipling your heart to love God and love others. You are teaching your heart who is in boss, Jesus or money. Every time you give, you're teaching and discipling your heart. You should also know that your generosity has a much greater impact on those around you than just impacting or just affecting today's needs. Because sacrificial and compassionate generosity changes generations. There's a trickle-down effect to your sacrificial generosity. You can't always see it right away, and, and some of you might not even know all of the stories until you're in heaven someday. But you have to realize that heaven is filled because of people's radical generosity. Heaven is filled with stories about lives that were changed because of your sacrificial generosity. I mentioned last week that in a couple of months, later this summer, our church is celebrating its 40th anniversary. And as someone who transitioned into leadership at this church, I've always been keenly aware that, that God has now placed me in a position of leadership in a church that I did not build. Right? And of course, it's always God building the church. He's the head of the church, but he did that through someone who preceded me, and he did that through many of you in this room. And as I think and I pray about that, I, I'm always humbled and honored, but I, I'm compelled to keep it going. And obviously, right, like some of the decisions that we make affect our day-to-day -day operations. They affect what we're going to do this week or this month. But we also want to make decisions in our church that impact not only our local congregation, but our city and the world for generations to come. For generations to come. So know this morning that your sacrifice and your generosity impacts not only today, but it impacts someone's grandkids tomorrow. Your generosity today means that we are positioned to pass our faith down to the next generation and the generation after that, that we're creating space together for kids and grandkids to experience Jesus, for kids to be baptized, and for us someday to see generational baptisms of grandparents, parents, kids, and grandkids. We give so that we can dig wells in Zimbabwe on our cause wall out in the lobby, you can see that we're feeding 2,000 kids a day in Zimbabwe, that we've dug our first well, that 10 acres of land have been donated to our work there. We dug that well not just for today. Of course it is for today, but it's also so that families can be fed for generations, so that farms can be created and sustained for generations. We give to young lives so that they can minister to teenagers because we don't know who they're going to become in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. Or we might be celebrating a 40th anniversary this year and, and blessing God for all that he's done in our church, but we give to young life so that they can give to the next generation and they can minister to the next generation so that in another 40 years, we have similar stories of lives being transformed because of the gospel. I hope and I pray that you catch that vision, that when you give, you're not just giving for today, you're giving for generational impact. Again, if you want another radical generosity story from inside of our church, then you have to know that we have people inside of our church family who are designing their wills and planning their estate to tithe or to give on all that they have when they pass away so that their generosity can continue for years after they pass. Isn't that incredible? I met with one person from our church who has done this, and when I asked why, this was the response. I said, I simply want my estate to go where it would have gone had I kept living, to the nonprofits and to the organizations that I trust to continue the work of Christ. This is generational generosity at its peak, right? I'm, we might not all be called to that, but that is inspirational. That's something to aspire to. 
It's compassion that extends beyond one's life, and it's a legacy that will advance the kingdom for years and generations to come. You know, all of these challenges, right? All of these ways that our heart can lean towards money over love, love for ourselves, maybe money over love for others, it all draws us to kind of the pinnacle of this series. What happens when our heart chooses money over love even for God? And that's the final point for this morning and for this entire series. Again, not very many people willingly admit they love money more than God. Not very many people are willing to admit that, but as only Jesus can do, he always knows the right word at the right time and how to draw a line in the sand, kind of confronting us with his teachings. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus said to his disciples this, verse that just kind of resonates within my heart. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. Now, over the last 15 years in ministry, I've heard a lot of interesting interpretations about what that scripture might mean and what it might not mean, and they've all been very creative in their theological application. It's actually a pretty straightforward verse. If you love me, you'll follow me. If you love me, you'll abide in me. If you love me, you'll obey what I have taught. And that, by the way, includes his teachings on generosity. If you're not a follower of Jesus, then then please know you're always welcome to explore Christ at our church. You're welcome to learn about Christianity and Jesus and the church by hanging with us and getting to know us, I have loved that about our church. I don't want that to ever change about our church. But if you're here, if you're a follower of Christ, you eventually have to wrestle with John, 14, or John 15, 14. Right? You eventually have to wrestle with this reality that Christ said to love me is to follow me. To love me is to obey me even when it comes to teachings that might be hard, even when it comes to teachings that might stress you out or make you anxious or topics that you don't want to talk about. I feel very little pressure this morning to convince you of this. I was thinking about it on the way in, like I feel no pressure at all. I feel, I feel no pressure to preach this whatsoever because I, I realize I'm not going to convince you anyway. I am very content to just hold the scriptures like a mirror to our church and say, as we go through the scriptures together, how how are our hearts going to respond to this? How are our hearts going to respond to to this passage in John, where he says, if you love me, you'll follow me. If you love me, you'll obey me. In order to learn from each other, you know that I interviewed a lot of people from our church who give consistently. And all the interviews were private, all the quotes have been kept anonymous, but one of the most commonly repeated ideas, I mean from multiple interviews that I had, one of the most commonly repeated ideas was that giving is a lot more like a marriage than anything else. That you commit to giving, you keep at it, you grow with it, over time you get better at it. When times are good, you are married to generosity. When times are tough, you're married to generosity. When you feel like it, you show it and you lavish generosity on the world around you. And when you don't feel like it, you still do it because you want that to be a part of your lifestyle in following Christ. Giving is like a marriage. I heard that over and over and over again. As I just kind of bring this whole series to a close, and particularly this message, I want to just close with just a couple of reflections. Now, I realize this morning that over the course of the last four weeks, many of you have decided to give to this church for the first time, or maybe you increased your giving. And I just want to say thank you for the way that you have responded to God. Your generosity, I've said this a couple of times, I want to reiterate it again, your generosity is a mark of your discipleship with Christ. And thank you for the ways that you've responded to his love. I also know that many of you in this room, as well as those who are viewing online, you have given consistently for years upon years upon years. Over decades, you have cultivated a generous lifestyle that has impacted hundreds, if not thousands, locally, but also internationally. And my prayers for you, among many of my prayers for you, but one of my prayers for you is that this morning you will remember why you give. 
that you'll remember why you give. You know, sometimes consistent givers, especially if it's like the bill pay or the automatic giving that comes out, we can sometimes forget about how we're giving, and it just becomes automatic. And on one hand, this is a beautiful reality in our own journey with Christ because it means that generosity has become part of our lifestyle. But at the same time, if we're not careful, then giving can become an obligation or giving can just be a checkbox that we check off to feel good about our little Christian selves. But I want to encourage you, remember why you give. That, that it's not an obligation, but it's a partnership with God centered on joy and discipleship, on gratitude, and ultimately on a response for all that he has done for us, for all that he has given to us. Now, someone inside of our church said it this way, the key to giving is knowing. The key to giving is knowing what God has done for us, what God has given to us, which is everything. It's everything. So remember why. Remember that he has saved us from the darkest places. He's adopted us into his family and established us in his kingdom forever. That as children of God, we are forgiven and set free and invited to join him in his mission of transforming all things. I pray that you will give and lead a life that reflects Christ's generosity to us. Remember that as we live generously back to him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your presence here this morning. We worship you and we love you. We love all that you said to us, including the topics that stress us out, including the topics that make us a little anxious, or including the topics that we'd rather have the preacher not talk about. Thank you for every word that you gave us. Would you shape our hearts? Would you disciple our lives? And would we be generous to you as you have been generous to us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're new to the vineyard after every message, we always create an opportunity for you to just sit quietly and reflect on all that you've just heard. We've realized in our culture, we have such a fast pace of living that if we just rush off to whatever is next, we might miss some of what God is saying to us right here and right now. So our band is present, but they're just going to play quietly, and we would encourage you to stay seated for a couple of moments and kind of have a private prayer time with God. He might highlight one or two things for you this morning. If you want to learn how to give, Uh, You can go to votrweekly.org and look at my sermon notes. We wrote a little, uh, a paragraph or two there on how to give. And as always, if you're looking for a financial coach, there is a link in my sermon notes to email you because we would love to get you connected with some of our financial coaches as well. But take these next few moments for yourself. And then shortly, I'll be back up to lead us into a time of ministry and response together.
Let's stand together. In addition to creating that time of quiet reflection and personal prayer time with God, we always want to create an opportunity for you to respond to God actively, individually, as well as corporately. There's a couple of ways that we've created response time for you this morning. Of course, our band is present. They're going to sing a few more songs. And so we would encourage you to engage with worship and make these songs your prayers this morning. We have communion up front. If you want to come forward and remember all that Christ has done for you, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood, so that you could be forgiven and set free, then in a moment we would invite you to come forward and take communion. Of course, if you came prepared to give as an act of worship, you can do that by using the boxes in the back or you can give online at any time. And every Sunday we gather, we have an opportunity for you to receive prayer. Our prayer team is in the back there. They all have lanyards on so you can find kind of who to go to in the back. But we just really know this is a huge, a huge part of why we gather, a huge reason why we gather is to support each other in prayer and to minister to one another. And there have been a lot of things that have happened by just uh, you know, humbly stating before God and before another, I need prayer this morning. I need prayer this morning. It's amazing what God can do in that moment when you take a humble heart and you match it with a willing servant of God to pray for you. It's amazing what God can do in that space. And so we wanna create an opportunity for you to receive ministry every Sunday we gather. You can do that by our prayer team in the back. And as I was just kind of praying about how to respond, there's just two things that are on my heart that I want to share with you. One is that I, as I was talking about contentment, some I just feel like some in this room or maybe some online, you were like, oh man, that is me. I've never been content. When my income's gone up, I've wanted more. When my income's gone down, I've feared more. I've never been able to just rest in contentment. And if that's you, I, we just want to pray for you this morning. We want to ask God to break through in your heart to show you in a real and tangible way that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he will always be with you and that that contentment can begin to set you free from the love of money. The second thing that I want to pray for, and I'm going to pray this over the whole room so you, you might get this, you might not. I don't know how God's going to move. Is that in, in Romans chapter 12, Paul, who wrote Romans, he lists out these gifts that the Spirit gives to believers. And there's a whole bunch of different gifts. He talks about leading and serving and praying for the sick and all kinds of, of different gifts. But one of the gifts in Romans 12 says the gift of generosity. The gift of generosity. Now, this is different than like the faithful givers, the people who show up consistently and say, man, I am going to give consistently because I want to obey God. This is different because it's listed as a gift of generosity. It's something beyond your normal giving. It's something that blesses the local church and expands the kingdom in significant ways. And I have no idea who has that gift in this room, but I suspect that some of you have it. And I suspect that God wants to give it to a few more of us. And so that's how I'm going to lead us into a time of ministry and response is just by asking God to have his way in our hearts. Now you can resist this prayer and it's okay. I'll have no idea. But I do want to say this. If you don't resist it and you approach it and you say, God, if this is for me, I'm willing, I'm willing to live in this gift. Just be ready. Because compassion usually grows with generosity. And he might start breaking your heart for the people around you that are in need. He might start breaking your heart for causes and, and ways that you can give extravagantly to transform the world. And so just be ready because I don't know how God might move in your heart. You might know that he's moving in your heart and you might feel nothing at all. That's up to you. It's up to God. The results are in his hands. But let's start our response time by praying this prayer together. God, in Romans chapter 12, you say that there is a gift of generosity. You say this in Romans 12, verse 8. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is generosity, give generously. God, if that gift is for us, would you give it to us now? I pray for the folks in this room and I pray for the folks who are viewing online. I suspect that some of us already have this gift. I ask that you would increase it in Jesus' name. And I also suspect that some of us 
are called to this gift of generosity. We just don't know it yet. And if that's for us, would you give that gift to us now in Jesus' name? Remove all the ways we're trying to disqualify it. Remove all the ways where we say, oh, maybe I don't make enough to be really generous. No, it's never about the amount. It's about the heart in which you give. Would you release that gift of generosity right now in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Come forward for communion. Go back for prayer. In a few songs, I'll be back up to close our service this morning.
God, here we are again, ready to lay all that we have and all that we are at your feet. Help shape us into the image of your son. Help us to become more and more like you with no shame and with no condemnation. Help us leave behind our old ways and with trust and love and passion, let us lay hold of everything that you have before us. We know that you are creating us anew time and time again. We say yes to that, Lord. We say we love you and we worship you. Come and have your way in our lives and in our church, in our city and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for hanging with us for four weeks on all things generosity, money, and the words of Christ. It's been a powerful series for many. God bless you. We'll kick off a new uh, message next week. Uh, But have a great start to your day and a great start to your week. We'll see you next Sunday. Take care.